I'll have a discussion with Valley ROP as to whether or not it's a good idea for you to stay here in class. So leaving the speakers inside your ear, even with it turned off, as far as I'm concerned, is using your cell phone. Anybody have any questions about cell phone use? During break, it's party on. Okay, I think that's enough of the syllabus for one day. So here we go. Introduction to human factors. Just for fun, I thought it would be way more fun. If and I, I usually wait till the end of the hour to get to some a video. But I found that I end up getting to the hour uh, and then I forget. So I'm sorry, this hour is not good. But this is from the cockpit of the 747. I can't recall what uh, airport you're going to. It's hard, it's hard to tell. I'm just looking at airport. showed you a picture of an airliner landing, and this is at St. Martin's, and I'm pretty sure it's in the Caribbean. And there's a 747 out there. We'll get it a little closer here. Here we go. So this is being, this video is being taken by somebody on the beach. This video is being taken by somebody on the beach. And they, the still, airport is still open, and they still do it just like this. The end of the runway is right next to the beach. When I say right next to it, we'll see what I mean by right next to it. That, again, that's the same, same airplane or same model of airplane as a Boeing 747. The new big ones will hold about 500 people pretty easily. Yeah, we don't need to buy any. So let's see. This spot right there. This is not retouched. This is not photoshopped. This is not video editing. So. I'm going to guess the distance from the top of the, their heads to the bottom of the wheel. The wheel's pretty darn big, so that distance is actually not too bad. That's probably 30, 40 feet. And you can actually walk a little closer and literally look up and have it fly all over you. There's a whole bunch of YouTube videos on there if you want to watch that sort of thing, which I think is fun. But, uh, whoops. Pushed the wrong button. All right. So we're going to talk about human factors training. So human factors, I guess that's the very first thing on the next line here I'm going to have, is what is human factors? Hopefully that's what it is. Yay! So what is the goal of human factors training? It's to increase safety by optimizing performance or reducing human error. Okay, that sounds lovely. So performance is talking about you as the pilot. How can you be a better pilot? And reducing human error. That means you, you make less mistakes. Has anybody in here ever made an error? How many people have made an error today? Yeah, okay. Well, I think you may have all made an error. Maybe not. I make errors every single day. My hope, my goal, is to try to, try to pay attention to what's going on and make as few of them as I can. And I have to accept the fact that as a human being, I am imperfect. Just for fun, I don't want to get into a religious discussion, but does anybody prescribe to a religion that believes that humans are imperfect? That's part of my spiritual beliefs. I believe that humans are imperfect. They are not perfect, and you have to work at it to do better. 
And no matter what you do to become perfect, you're still just trying and you're still going to make mistakes. Okay, that's okay. Well, according to your raised hand, most of you do not have a spiritual belief system that thinks that humans are imperfect. So do you have a, does anybody have a spiritual belief system where humans are perfect? Okay, does that mean that many of you don't have a spiritual belief system? Okay, well, it's okay. You can talk to me at, at break time if you want to talk spirituality. I'd be happy to do that. So there are two main areas of focus in human factors training, and that's where uh, single pilot resource management. So single pilot is hyphenated, so that way they can come up with a three-letter acronym, SRM. So if you're a pilot these days and somebody says SRM, you're going to go, oh, yeah, single pilot resource management. It used to be crew resource management, but then they realized we weren't focusing on people where there's just one pilot because there's no other crew. Has anybody ever been in a car and somebody was driving and a different person was navigating and saying, turn left, turn right? I know back in the old days before GPS was on your phone, it was helpful to have someone in the car with a map. My wife and I took a trip a long time ago, and we went to, uh, gosh, it's been... I think it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been 10 years now. We went to Ireland and Scotland and England, and we rented a car for most of it. I drove 2,400 miles in three weeks, and I drove on the wrong side of the road. So I'm on the right-hand side of the car driving on the left-hand side of the road. So it's all I can do to make sure I don't drive on the wrong side. So thank goodness my wife is good at maps. So she navigated the whole time, and she was telling me, turn left and turn right. She had the maps and going on. So we had a crew. I was, tr I was responsible for not hitting anyone or anything, and she was responsible for telling me where to turn. And not that I was perfect. I only hit one curb once and cut the tire, and we had to replace the tire, but I didn't hit any other motor vehicles. And I didn't hit any other structures other than the curb, but the curb was just right and the tire was just right, and I was parking. And the, over there, I was parking like this instead of parking like that. I was parking like this, and it was just right, and the wheel, the rim, metal of the rim cut, hit the tire and the curb, and it, it cut the tire. It was 100 bucks for a tire. But all things considered, for 2,400 miles renting cars, I was pretty happy. But we were a crew. In the old days, they used to call it a crew. They used to call it crew resource management because you had a pilot, a co-pilot, maybe a flight attendant or two. But then they realized, well, we're talking about these crew where there's more than one human on the airplane, but we're leaving out all these airplanes where there's only one pilot. So they decided to say, well, there's crew resource management, which is different because there's somebody sitting there next to you that can help you. Or there's single pilot resource management, which is what we're going to talk about. Because when you earn your private pilot certificate, generally there's nobody else on the airplane that can help you very much. It's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friends, stuff like that, and they don't know anything about flying. And all they can, you say, show me, the, hold, hold the map up so I can see it. That's about all they can do. You know, they can't, you can't say, well, what's the restricted use airspace ahead of us? And they're going to go, restricted what? So we're really talking single pilot resource management. So that's one of the things we're going to focus on. And this is the definition of single pilot resource management. And just to be clear, I'm sure you all read the reading assignment. Chuck, he chuckled. Uh, this is the abbreviated definition. It's where you use all the assistance you can get from inside and outside of the airplane before and during a flight to try to do everything correctly. Is it extra hot today outside? Is it extra humid? The guy I share my office with likes to open his door to the lab out there in airplane mechanic school, and there's no air conditioning out there. So all the cool air inside of our office just floats out of our office, and all of the hot, humid air floats in. So then I sit there, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and unfortunately I have a whole lot of built-in insulation, and so my body temperature uh, goes up when uh, when I'm exposed to warm air, and then I sweat. So my apologies. I've asked him about it, and he says, well, if I remember, but sometimes he likes to just sit in his office and be able to turn, even though he's got a window, he wants to look out the door. All right. So we're going to talk more about single pilot resource management, but it's effectively, okay, here you are in an airplane. You're the only person on the airplane that knows what the heck is going on, 
what are all the things you can do? What are all the resources you can make yourself avail uh, that can, that are available to you to help make sure you're doing it well? Like, can I call somebody and talk to them about the weather, or am I just stuck trying to read it on a computer screen? Yeah, there's actually somebody you can call and talk on the telephone and say, hey, I'm a VFR private pilot. I can only fly outside of the clouds. Tell me about the weather in English instead of me trying to figure it out off of this document online. And then you got any advice about whether that's a good idea or not. Or when you're in the air, you can call and talk to air traffic controllers. You can talk to that same person, that same person that knows about weather. There's radio frequencies you can talk to. And then, of course, you can always talk to your flight instructor before takeoff. So there's a lot of resources you have besides just you sitting in your airplane going, gosh, I wish I knew what to do. The second area of focus is aviation physiology. You're going to hear that phrase a lot, aviation physiology. It's a fun word to spell. I'm just kidding. It's kind of like physics, P-H-Y. Why don't they just spell it with an F? I don't know. Does anybody in here want to take responsibility for, for spelling in the English language? No, I don't want to take responsibility for all the words in the English language because most of them are spelled weird. That's one thing I like about Spanish. You ever notice in Spanish that the majority of the letters in Spanish, the pronunciation of that letter is almost the same almost all the time? Man, it's like, oh well. I guess if I was born in Mexico, I wouldn't have to worry too much about speaking English. Oh, unless I was a pilot, and then I'd have to learn to speak English. Okay, so I guess at some point I'd have to, of course, I'd only have to be able to speak aviation English. Just so you know, the international language in, on air traffic control is English. If, you, if I fly to France and I start talking to the air traffic controller in English, they will talk back to me in English. But if I take off an airplane in France and I start talking to them in French, of course, they're going to talk to me in French. But it's the same everywhere you go. If United Airlines or American Airlines flies into China, as soon as they get into Chinese airspace, of course, air traffic controller, it says United Airlines, so they know they're going to speak English. So they're going to be speaking English to them. So if you're going to leave your home country and go to somewhere else, you're going to need to speak English. Now what's interesting, though, if you get your pilot certificate in France, you can do it by just knowing Fran French. But now you can't leave France. Because as soon as you go to Belgium or Germany or Austria or England or Spain, the air traffic controllers are not going to be speaking French. They're going to speak English to you. So aviation physiology, sorry, I got on a rant there. Aviation physiology, here it is. The study of performance and limitations of the human body in the flight environment. Oh, man, Mr. Johnson, you're giving me all them big words. It's a long time, it takes a long time to spell them. Well, that's true. So I'll give you a minute to write, and then I'll tell you a little bit about aviation physiology. So the thing about the human body... Hard day at the office? You have to leave. I'm sorry? At 2 o'clock? Oh, because it's every Wednesday. All right. Thanks. See you later. You'll want to go online tonight and uh, finish watching this lecture and taking notes. John C. Johnson, and you'll see my ugly face. I mean, my picture. Uh, today I'll probably have it posted at between 3 and 4. If I don't, send me a text, okay? So let's, I want to talk just a couple, give you an example. You don't have to write it down. Aviation physiology. You ever notice if you're in bright lights and then you walk out of the house and it's dark outside, it's hard to see. But if you stay outside where it's dark, after 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, your eyesight gets better. Yeah, it's because the, the way your eyeball works, if you shine bright light in it, the things that can see in low light don't work very well. And it takes as long as 20 minutes to get used to the dark. So let's say you're going to go flying at night. So what do you do when you go flying at night and you have to visually inspect the airplane 
you put a red lens over your flashlight or you get a flashlight that has a red LED in it because the red light doesn't ruin your night vision. And in fact, in a lot of airplanes, the lights that shine on the instruments are a red light. So that way, when you look out the window, planes or see ports or lights on the ground, you can see really well because you have good night vision. You haven't run your night vision. So just a very small example of why is it a good idea for pilots to understand how the human body works. And we're only going to talk about the things about the human body and how they work as they apply to flying. Like when you climb in a little airplane and you go up to higher altitude, the airplane isn't pressurized. So the air gets thinner and thinner and thinner and less air is pushing on you. So the air inside of you tries to expand. It makes you fart. Now, I mean, it doesn't make you fart every time, but it's going to make you fart maybe twice as much as you normally would. So if you never fart, not fart. It's funny. I, I'm glad you're laughing, but it's, you just got to recognize that. It's like, okay, I'm getting to 10,000 feet. Oh, man, I'm going to rip a new one. Oh, you know, open the vents. So it's good to know about how the body works, because the gases inside of your body are going to try to expand if there's less pressure pushing in on it. We're going to spend a whole chapter on aviation physiology near the end of the semester. Okay, so does anybody remember what SRM is? Sing okay, that makes two people, single pilot resource management. You can write the six parts to SRM. Here, I'll give an example of, a, of the test question. I know some of our new friends here don't know yet, but there is only one big final exam in this class. We're going to have quizzes every day on the previous day's lecture, and all those things added up, I think, add up to 30% of your grade. But the final exam is worth 40%. There's no test in the middle. So here, so what you can do is every time you see a quiz, okay, this is the way Mr. Johnson writes questions. Because on that final exam day, it's going to be 50 questions. And I'm not saying quiz questions, but the way I write the questions is going to be really, really similar. The only difference is on that final exam, I'll have a little more uh, multiple choice. Like on the quizzes, they're weak for multiple choice, but usually I have a few multiple choice on the final exam. But like here, I would give you this question, and I would this is what the, te the, te the final exam question would be like this. Name the seven parts to single, re single pilot resource management. And that way you would write down six, and you would have to leave one blank, and then you would get it wrong, and no one would get 100%, and then I would be happy. Okay, y'all don't want me to be happy? I'm just kidding. I would never do it like that. The six parts, you know, I, would be a, it would, I would probably put a question and say there are six parts to single, resource, single pilot resource management. Tell me four out of those six. It would be something like that, because it's hard to remember every single stinking detail. The first one is aeronautical decision making. Aeronautical decision making is how do you figure out what you're going to do as a pilot or if you were a mechanic or an air traffic controller. So we're going to specifically talk about ways to make decisions as a pilot. There's also risk management. Has, has anybody ever had a job and went to the risk management department? I worked at lots of companies that had risk management departments. They're the ones that decide how much insurance your company should buy. So what they do is they say, okay, we've got 27 18-wheel trucks, and we haul peaches and other kinds of fruit around the Central Valley, and we pick them up uh, at packing sheds, and we take them to distribution centers all over the state, sometimes in Arizona and Nevada and Oregon. Okay, so they start thinking about, well, what could happen, and how bad would it be? Well, one of our trucks could drive off the side of a cliff and kill the driver. Not that that's good, but that's not the worst thing you could do, right? What's the worst thing you could do with an 18-wheeler? Kill somebody else, like drive it into a busload of Aviation Valley ROP students on their way to and from Selma, Sanger. Oh, you're driving your car, so we don't care about you. I only care about the students on the bus. So if our truck ran into a bus full of kids and killed 10 of them, would we need more insurance than if we just, the truck driver ran off the side of the road and off a cliff? Yeah. So you start, the risk management people start thinking about, well, how often is this going to happen? And if it does, how much is it going to cost? And then they start thinking about how much insurance they need to buy. And then they start going, well, maybe we need to drug test our drivers. 
you know, we ought to test them for marijuana and cocaine and prescription drugs that they're not prescribed for and test them for alcohol and do it randomly. And then if you get caught, then we fire you. And then everybody's either too scared to, uh, to do all those things or they quit and get another job. I mean, that's so there are things you can do is obviously you could get more insurance, but you can also do things to reduce the likelihood that it will occur. Like I worked at the flight school I worked at, every single employee before the, your first day of work, they said, here, go here and take a drug test. And they tested you for all kinds of good stuff. So if you couldn't pass a drug test, we wouldn't even hire you. And then all of our flying students, same deal. And then every employee and every student, every quarter, three, well, four times a year, we had a company randomly generate numbers and tell us who we were going to drug test. We tested about 10% of the employees and the students four times a year. Interesting enough, I was there for eight years. I only got tested just before I got the job, and my number never came up. I'd, I'd have been clean. I'd have been absolutely clean. It wasn't going to be an issue. All right, so we'll, we're going to talk more about risk management. Task management is figuring out, look at all the things I have to do, and which one do I need to do first? Let's see. The engine just stopped running. Do I need to call somebody on the radio and tell them, or do I need to see if I can fix the problem? Which do you, I know you don't, you're not pilots yet, but which do you think would be more important to do first? Try to get the engine back running, or do you think you need to call somebody and tell them? I just, you know, there's this phrase, it's called aviate, navigate, communicate. Well, communicate's the last one. Aviate means fly the airplane and make sure it's doing what you want it to do. In this case, it would be, ah, maybe it ran out of fuel in one tank and you've got to switch the lever so it'll get out of the other tank. And the engine starts going, yay! That's happened a lot. You'd be surprised how often people are flying along with two tanks full of gas and they burn all the fuel out of that tank and the engine quits. And then they remember to reach down and switch the lever. The good news is the engine will start up in two, three, four seconds. But it's enough to make you want to pee your pants. Or you might fart. I, you know, I don't know. Everyone has a different response when they get scared. I don't know. Does anybody have a different response to being scared to share with the rest of the class? Don't worry, I won't share any of the things that happened to me. You don't want to hear about them. So we'll talk, task management is to figuring out what do I do first, what do I do second, what do I do third. Situational awareness. Here, let me give you an example of situational awareness. This one is going to come up when you are in flight training. Your instructor is going to talk about this a lot. And it's really a pretty good idea to think about it when you're driving a car. And that's what I'm going to use. Let's say you're driving in a park in Fresno, that doesn't have to be in Fresno, your hometown parking lot, and it's at a grocery store. What kind of people go to grocery stores? Mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, pretty much everybody goes to grocery stores. You may be getting dragged along by your parents, but if you're a little kid, you get to go. So, to be situationally aware in a grocery store parking lot as you're driving around is to pay attention. You're driving down the parking rows, and you look ahead about seven or eight cars, and it looks like all the cars are full. You're going to have to go way down there. And you see a mom with two or three little tiny kids, and she's not holding all of their hands. What am I going to do? What's that? You're going to hit the accelerator and go see how fast you can... You're going to take one down. Yeah, this is not Death Race 2000. Sorry, no extra points for running over the little kids. What you're going to do is, there's many things you could do. You could slow down. Maybe all you do is take your, when you get close, you take your foot off the accelerator. You don't put it on the brake, but you hold your foot right on top of the brake. Anybody heard of that phrase, guarding the brake? So it's like, bam, you can put on the brake in like a tenth of a second. Because you're just like waiting for one of those kids. My wife has a thing. If your kid is under five years old and you're not holding their hand in a parking lot, you're a bad, you're not doing everything you could as a parent to keep your kid safe. So. And it, my wife is a kindergarten teacher. She teaches five-year-olds. You'd be surprised how many things teaching five-year-olds is the same as teaching 18-year-olds. If you want a list, let me know. I have a list because I take teaching uh, lessons from my wife. In any case, you are aware of the situation and you do something about it or you get ready to do something about it. So, for instance, situational awareness. 
you're driving down the road on the freeway and you're doing about 12 or 13 miles an hour over the freeway and your radar detector goes off. You have more data to to make you aware of the situation. You're going, hmm, there is a police officer somewhere with their radar turned on and maybe I will take my foot off the gas and slow down closer to the speed limit so I don't have to write a tick, get a ticket, and tell my parents. And then the cops won't pull me over and take me to jail and impound my parents' car for me taking a car and driving it, even though I don't have a driver's license. Not that I would have ever done that as a kid. More than four times after I got caught. After I got caught doing that, I never did that again. Never did that again. I mean, my parents caught me. The cops didn't catch me. In any case, well, I was 15 and a half. Well, it's a long story. It's a long story. So situational awareness is thinking about what's going on and what might you be, need to be ready for. This one's always fun if you can avoid controlled flight into terrain. You want to be aware of where the terrain is. And when I say terrain, I'm talking about the ground, the rocks, the mountains, the sand, the rivers, the ocean, the trees. Anything that's connected to the earth, buildings, towers, these are all part of the terrain. It's pretty much everything except the birds and the other flying machines. Because the air, we don't worry about hitting the air. The air's all right. And we will talk about weather. But there, there are a lot of accidents where the pilots were, had a certificate to fly in the, in, with outside of the clouds, like a private pilot certificate, you can't fly inside the clouds. And they accidentally, or on purpose, flew into the clouds, and they lost control of the airplane when they were flying it, and they thought they were flying it right, and then all of a sudden, bam, into the side of a mountain. It's called controlled flight into terrain. They were still in control of the airplane, and they flew themselves into a mountain. I hate that. I hate, I hate controlled flight into terrain. So that's a really, really, really good reason not to fly in the clouds when you don't have a license to fly in the clouds. Automation management, if I didn't tell you what it was, it might be rather interesting to try to figure out what automation management is. Automation management is handling all the things on the airplane that are done for you, for the pilot. For instance, the autopilot. You turn on the autopilot, is it just going to fly you straight and level? It won't climb, it won't descend, it won't turn left, it won't turn right? Maybe. What if you've got it hooked up to fly a navigation transmitter, and when it hits that navigation transmitter, and it goes past it, the airplane says, hey, I'm supposed to be flying towards that transmitter. What if it turns around and goes back to that transmitter when you really wanted it to keep going straight? Yeah, so... It depends on how your autopilot is set up. And I'm telling you right now, in the long term, when you become an airline pilot, the thing you're going to have to learn that you won't have a lot of experience is, is, is a ridiculously complicated autopilot called an FMS, a flight management system. You don't have to write this down. But it's got a keyboard with all 26 letters and all 10 numbers on it, 1 through 0 or 0 through 9. And you're telling the autopilot where you I want to go here, then I want to go there, then I want to go there. And when I get there, I want to climb to this altitude. And when I get there, I want to descend to that altitude. And when I get there, I want to, and when I get here, I want to follow the instrument landing system and I want to land. It's reasonably complicated. Once you learn how to do it, it's just like you're doing it every day. It's not a big deal. I'm not telling you that it's so difficult you can't do it. You can. But understanding what automatic functions on the airplane are happening, whether I think I told it to do it or not. For instance, let's see if I can come up with another one. Uh, oh, there's, there's one model of little airplane with a landing gear, retracts, it goes up and down, and it's called retractable landing gear, and there's a lever in the cockpit. When you lift it up and a little light turns, there was a green light for each of the three landing gear, the nose wheel and the two main wheels. Those three lights go out and a red light comes off because the gear, the landing gear, are not in the right place. He just lifted the handle. It's going to take two, three, four, five seconds for all those landing gear to go clunk, 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 and they hit little twitches, and they open, and that red light goes off. Okay. Well, when you're coming into land, in most airplanes, the pilot or the pilot has to reach over and grab the handle and put it down. The computer doesn't do that. 
even on most airliners, the computer doesn't put the landing gear down. You actually, one, somebody in the front seats has to lift the handle and push it down. Well, a lot of the problem is if you if you're used to flying airplanes that, that the gears are stationary, they they're fixed, then they don't move. You never have to put the gear handle down before you land. So you learn how to you get checked out. You go buy or you rent an airplane with the landing gear handle, and you do it just fine. And you're flying it two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, and you're coming into land, and you forget to put the landing gear down because. You've flown 500 times, 10 of them have you had to put this, move this handle. And this time you forget, and you come in and you land, and it beats up the bottom of the airplane, and the propeller stops, and the inside of the engine is ruined. You know, it's a 20, 30, 50, 60, $100,000 repair. And the owner of the airplane's unhappy, and you didn't buy the extra insurance to cover that, and now they're going to sue you, and you end up living in a van down by the river eating government cheese. You can see where this is going. You don't want this to happen, right? So what one company did with their airplane was, because you ha only have to have the landing gear down when you, and you slow down before you come into land. You have to slow down to come in and land. So they set the system up that below a certain speed, if you didn't put the handle down yourself, when you slowed down enough, it would put the landing gear down for you, even if you forgot. Sweet, all right, now we won't have these accidents anymore. Oh, wait. When you go train in that airplane... You need to be able to put the gear handle up and down and not have the automatic system do it for you during training. So the flight instructors would pull the circuit breaker on the automatic landing gear system so it wouldn't work. And then they'd forget to push it in. And then later, maybe not that flight, one or two three flights later, somebody would come in and land and they'd forget to put the gear down and the automatic system didn't work and they still landed. So there's an automatic part of the airplane maybe supposed to do something for you. But you need to understand when is it supposed to work, why is it supposed to work, and do I need to push in that circuit breaker to make it work? So first of all, these six things, oh wait, there it is. And remember, if that's uh, one minute fast, that means we're coming up on 10 after. So 20 after on your clock, 21 after on that clock, we meet back in here for the next class. We'll start aeronautical decision making tomorrow. Okay, you got 10 minutes. If you have some papers that I need, please give them to me. And Luis and Jordan, I'm afraid I need to take up a big chunk of your. Can I borrow that? Yeah, you're going to keep this. You have the one that says 102, correct? Because it, oh, here, can I have that? Can I have to tear off that back piece? Sweet, thanks. Okay, so that's for the one for 102. You have the one for 103? I mean, the one that says 101? You have this? That, that's okay. That's okay. I only need one of those because both of the back pages are the same. So, Jordan, am I saying that correct? Yes. Okay, 101 and 102. Did I give you these earlier today? Okay. Did you get, would you check and make sure one says 101 and one says 102? Yeah. You couldn't find it? Oh, man. It's the end of the world. Um, I can't register you for class, or the Valley ROP can't register you, until we get your Reedley College ID number. So what you might want to do is go to the records office and ask them, Hey, this is me. I need my ID number. Can you tell me what? I'm, you won't have time to do it during break, but you could do it after class. Uh, do you know where the student services office is? Parking permit. Yes. Yep. Oh, yeah, you have a Reedley College ID? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 